let me start off by introducing you this is well you this is the artist jeff francis but he's not just an artist he's not just a visual artist he he's a painter he's a sculptor he's a filmmaker he's a photographer he's a writer he's a poet he's a lyricist i'm sure i've left things out um you've been uh, on the shortlisted you uh, you've been on the sharp the sarchi shortlist haven't you Yes, considerable time ago because uh, I got bored. <laughs> we kept right. going, getting on there, <laughs> kept getting on there, but never to, the, you know, what is it? Always the uh, bridesmaid, never the bride. So <laughs> I see. What, uh, I get very, I actually, one gets, I get frustrated when I walk around uh, galleries and also at many galleries. And uh, why also, why do you get frustrated? Yeah, because, you know, the what one considers the quality of the work that's there yeah. is, um, yeah, very, very um, disappointing that it has the space and other good work doesn't. But you feel that as artists, I think we all feel that anyway, that uh, we're not appreciated as much as we should be. And I guess what makes good art can be so subjective. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is making. And it's it, it's got so intellectual and so uh, concept conceptual. You know, uh, my idea of a piece of conceptual art would be to put a blackboard up, write the idea on, and then leave it, and let mm -hmm. other people's imagination be fired. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I find when I'm painting with uh, in abstract art. Um, is that, that my idea is that when you look into a piece of abstract art, it should fire the imagination like looking into the fire does or looking at clouds. You know, that's that's really it. You shouldn't be telling people too much. And people then find everything that they want in there, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the effect can be kind of deadening. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can, yeah. can I ask a little bit about where do you even begin with you? Uh, you have so many <laughs> strands to your life. Are there any common ones? Are there any common themes across your work? Uh, love of nature. Love and nature. Love of love, nature. And love love and of nature. nature. Occasionally love, but no, love of, of nature. Um, and working for it. I mean, what I... And, you know, this is a critical time to be working for it, but I have been doing that all my, all my life. Um, you know, I was doing stuff at university in the 60s uh, on behalf of people like the World Wildlife Fund and then went on to get involved in all sorts of uh, projects. I started the first recycling, uh, paper recycling campaign for Friends of the Earth and ran that for a while till local kids set fire to the warehouse where we'd stored all the paper. Uh, and, uh, I was funded to do that by a famous artist called uh, Ed Fairfax Lucy, whose work was uh, superb. He died just a couple of years ago, but very, very nice man. And uh, so nature on a practical sense has, has always been uh, and love of animals has always been uh, part of uh, what's driven me throughout my life. You know, I had one of London's first vegan restaurants in the 70s and uh, did all, all sorts of, of stuff relating to animals. I worked with uh, Linda McCartney and Carla Lane and Rita Katashian, setting up an organisation for them uh, and running that for four years in the 80s and then campaigned uh, with the what at the time was the nascent uh, hillside animal sanctuary, which has become the largest in the world with over 4,000 animals, um, most of them large, 2,500 horses, for instance. So that's, that has, has driven me. Uh, and it was interesting because it was I didn't start painting full time till I was 40 uh, and I just resigned from Animal Line for, with Linda and Carla and Rita 
and uh, because actually humanity's inhumanity on a daily basis is, is a very hard thing to, to face. And it took me right to the edge. Um, so I stopped and I thought, I'd always wanted to paint. And I thought, well, if I don't do it now, I'm not gonna do it. So that was nearly 35 years ago. And I've been at it ever since, but I've, um, other manifestations of creativity are there. I'm, I'm, I'm a Gemini, so I get bored with things uh, rather quickly. I like to do several things at once, excuse mm -hmm. me. And um, I also, but central is communication. I want to communicate the things I feel to the rest of the world. And uh, I, I feel that what we're doing to the planet and what we have been doing for a very, very long time, at least the last 200 years, needs addressing. So what I've always sought to do is to celebrate and or question what we're doing with animals and the, the, uh, the planet. And uh, that's, that's been my, uh, my approach, is that celebration and questioning. Okay, so driving forces, We're talking about driving forces, maybe we could take you back right to the beginning and find out what were those early driving forces? What, what was your background and how did, this, how did this career of yours come about? Um, by not wanting to settle for anything else. I, um, my university course was psychology at Bedford College in Regent's Park. Um, and then I went on to um, join, to work with Friends of the Earth via uh, Ed, as I've, I've just said. And then um, that led me on to various campaigning issues. But in, in the meantime, I got involved with um, the music business uh, in terms of the retailing of music. Uh, and I started with 120 pounds worth of second round records, which I I borrowed from a friend and I, I uh, paid him back eventually. Uh, and I ended up with uh, creating eight shops at any one time and 13 altogether. And what we used to do is get too many records for one shop and go and open another and so on. So we actually ended up with three in Baker Street and uh, a jazz shop at one end and uh, a general shop at the other. And then just off Baker Street, just 40 feet off, we opened a very big store which had the veg vegan restaurant in it. Okay, and, and the painting. I mean, you say when you were 40, that was when you started. Had you done any painting as a child at all? Yes. I mean, uh, my, is it something that you took seriously? Yeah. My uncle was an artist, um, and I can remember at a very early age, seven years old, that I was bringing, quite naturally, not being uh, trained in any way, just bringing highlights into, into figures and things like that. And uh, when I went to grammar school, uh, the first year I was top of the year. And uh, then we had a change of personnel. And we had this guy come in who was wearing his flower ties and thought he was pretty groovy. He had a personality clash with me. I was never aware that I, of, at the age, 12 of having a personality clash with anyone, you know? And by the end of the third year, I was bottom of the whole year. So I'd gone down 142 places in, in art. And I sort of gave up, but I would do it for myself. And I always felt comfortable. If I went away on holiday, I'd go and find a, a cheap uh, place to buy a few paints and, and do some painting. But, uh, it wasn't until, as I say, I, I hit really hit 40, I thought I'm gonna have to go
go for it now. And the things I painted for the first 10 years were the things I'd been campaigning on. So they're the expressionist, but they're quite challenging and dark at times. And other times it's celebratory of, of nature. Uh, and uh, I was amazed what came through, to be honest. Uh, I know a lot of, of people will say, and I certainly agree with this. Uh, I trust artists and writers who say, I don't know where it came from, but it just came out, you know. Mm -hmm. And I understand even Picasso said you can't uh, paint perfection, but it, you can find it. It just mm -hmm. comes in. So I Michelangelo I was it with the stone, you know, he said that the figure is in there and I'm going to have to find it. And I'm not uh, likening myself to them, but I'm, I'm what I'm saying is that that's the experience, I believe. Mm -hmm. So... And I've got more and more um, bold in that aspect um, as one's grown in confidence. And uh, I, I tend with every, the work I do now, I tend to take it right to the edge and then I step into the void. So I'm going that much further and just see what comes. Um, what does that mean exactly, is that taking it right to the edge and, and stepping into the void? Well, you, you're not, what I mean is that I'm not um, doing anything that has any form of expectation to what's going to happen on the canvas or on the page. I just, but there's a step beyond that, I think, where you have to accept that you are in a void where things are coming to you. It's, I mean, some people might call it, um, or might refer to it in a way of, of actually being the, the um, sorry, Hannah, I'm, uh, I'm struggling for the word, but you're almost dreaming it down, you know? Uh, it's not, it's a connection that I think, unless you're part of it, you, uh, you know, you, you go through that experience, I think it, it's hard to put into words. Um, I guess working without any sense of expectation, letting, mm. letting, letting, uh, letting inspiration hit you in the moment. I guess they talk, I'm just thinking, relating it to, to music and what they would say about Mozart, that he would talk about himself as being about being a conduit. Uh -huh. Right. Absolutely. Music. That was the word I was trying for. <laughs> Sorry, it's a senior moment. But um yeah, that's that's exactly it. You are, you know, uh there was another. Let me say, but music, music is exactly that sort of experience. I mean, if you're looking at the great improvisers, um, do you know uh, Keith Jarrett's album, The Cologne Concert? Mm -hmm. Maybe, well, what, what do you... Uh, okay, Keith Jarrett's uh, jazz pianist, yeah, uh, and mm -hmm. straight, he's an improviser. Mm -hmm. And there's a lovely story, uh, and I used to use this when I was teaching for the University of the Third Age in releasing creativity. He, he and Manfred Eicher, who runs the ECM label uh, and believes it's what he's creating is like the classical music of tomorrow, mm -hmm. but it now has a huge uh, reputation, obviously, it has some great players on there. But he and uh, Jarrett were uh, touring around Europe and they were recording various concerts that they were doing. Mm -hmm. They got to Cologne and he got on, on stage to try out the piano that was there. And there was no lower register for him, really. It was, it, the piano was not in the best state. Then they went out to dinner and they got the waiter from hell. So when he walked on stage at 10 o'clock at night to play, he was 
ready for a fight. He should have been wearing boxing gloves almost, you know. And so he sat down and Ike was still recording this. Uh, he wasn't, you know, uh, let Jarrett get away with not, not having a version. And it's it's a real. I highly recommend it to anyone. We had when we had the jazz shop. Uh, it was it was a double album, and uh, you would get through one side, and someone would buy it seriously. And you hear in that first that opening, uh, he goes for about 10, 10 minutes, I'd say, and it's delightful. But he's playing high, you know. And all of a sudden you hear him go, oh, and he knows he's got it and he's in there and he's he's in the zone or in the groove or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, I always do, a chat, chat shop, you know, for people and get them to understand that that's where you need to be when you're creating. Mm -hmm. You don't need to have any preconceptions just go there and let it flow. And of course, this is what all the great jazz musicians and, and other people do. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's, I find it, it's very exciting as well when you're collaborating with, mm -hmm. with people on things. And you think that that experience is transferable from one art form to the next? Yes, absolutely. And I, when I talk about my, uh, my abstract work, uh, I describe it as inevitable chance. That is, it all looks, when you're doing it, it looks like it's happening by chance, but of course you're guiding certain things. Uh, but in the end, when you make that last mark, it's inevitable. That's how it should be. Mm -hmm. And that's when you need to walk away. Because there's always... <laughs> The, the mentality of a jazz musician to all sorts of different art forms, really, the, the mentality of uh, improvising. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, yeah, well, some of us improvise with life as well, don't we? I mean, that's the way we go on. Yeah. Happy go lucky. <laughs> <laughs> no, sometimes not so happy. I, I, um, the black dog has been a, a, a companion of mine for since the earliest times I can remember. So yeah, it, you know, it's not always e easy. Um, and in fact, you know, my, my feeling about that is that it goes with the territory of being an artist. Do you think um, so? I, yeah. 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 Why, why is that? Why do you think so? Why do I think so? Or why does it happen? I mean, it's, why, why it's a it sensitive, well, why, why, why I think it's a sensitive, Sorry. No, why do, you, why do you believe that to be to be the case? Well, I have to believe in that because it happens to me. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but why do you think it's sort of generally part I of think it does. You look at a lot of very, very uh, talented people in all sorts of areas and uh, they suffer. And you've, you, my own feeling is you, you've, if you look at the state of the world, you're bound to suffer uh, if you have empathy. Um, especially look at people like Spike Milligan, mm -hmm. absolute genius. There's no doubt about it. Um, a difficult man at times, but a very lovely man at times. I, I've been doing stuff around some stuff with, with Spike and, and now with his, his uh, daughter. Uh, Jane, but he suffered enormously, and yet he, in turn, feels like Stephen Fry's demons are even worse than than his work. You know, um, I think you've got to understand the sadness in life, and that will bring bring out a very positive response to the beauty uh, that is in the world as well. Yeah. Yeah, the relationship between depression and, and art is an, is an interesting one. You wonder to what extent is, an, is art a balm for depression? Uh, to what extent does it actually exacerbate it? 
<laughs> I think you got it in one there. It does both. It mm. does it absolutely does. But I I feel you, that one has to dive deep. That's what I I do when it comes my way. Uh, I dive very deep, and then I try and bring it up and express it through any art that I might be drawn to at the time, be that writing or be that uh, painting and just show the world, because I think the world needs to see. Um, whether they choose to see, well, that's a different story, you know. But, uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, there are those who can see, there are those who can see when they're shown, and there are those who will never see. And mm -hmm. that's... Uh, mm -hmm. That's... A, sadly the way of the world uh, it would be a better place if uh, if people could see but there are too many reasons not to see what's going on is is there frustration in, in combining so many art forms in that one can be a distraction from the other that you know if, if you feel like you're going really far with one then you kind of veer off and go into another does that mean that all of them something's put in a back burner while the other one goes ahead right yeah yeah but i mean it's well there are two two points i'd like to make here firstly i mean when when i'm working in the studio there will be several pieces of work around um and they will i'll might have a color on one that i'm f definitely finished with on that one then i'll look around and say Ah, that really would be good there, and and so, on. Um, but no, I find that uh, I often use music to um, when I'm working, um, and that there are several pieces that I did inspired by Jarrett, uh, for instance, when I and you just let the music come in and then see what lines and things come for you but um one part can inspire another mm -hmm. i mean i can be working on a painting for instance and then i'll suddenly see stuff in it it will appear and the title will appear and that title might in turn inspire a poem and I might have to go off and scribble down a few lines or a lyric or whatever um, and, and then come back uh, again. But I don't, it's interesting. I mean, you're talking about Backburner. I haven't painted seriously for about 18 months, but I have been writing like mad. I mean, we've just, I'm collaborating uh, with uh, a guy called Darren Ginn in the States uh doing various uh, songs uh so and uh he darren is a, a world-class pianist he's he's worked with an amazing number of people and he's a great arranger and uh we're working on well in fact the the first album we'd like to put out will be a cool jazz album so it'll have improvisations in it. But he, you know, it's good to improvise with words as well. And uh, it's, that collaboration is, is a very important thing. I mean, we're both Geminis and we're both long-term vegans as well and campaigners. Um, so with the Gemini so, uh, territory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I've got three others I work with. <laughs> other, other Gemini vegans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm the longest. I'm 52 years now vegan. So, uh, yeah. But um, it's, I think it's good to let one area of yourself fire off against another but you know sometimes you can only do that only happens in a group i mean f for people like uh, darren and i it tends to work uh, certainly just in in the pairing of, of it you know I'll, I'll throw 
In fact, how I got to, to know him, which was only a couple of years ago, I was on, uh, he's on LinkedIn and uh, people often uh, send me messages and things and I'll always send back the, the same message, which is, you know, if you're interested in collaborating to do something about what's happening to the planet and, and to celebrate it, then please come back. And I'd just done a book for the Poet Laureate's uh, competition on the uh, on ecology, and I I sent that off to him. And within a week, he came back with three really lovely pieces that had inspired in him. And that firing off each other is great, but I can do it to a degree within myself, within my own sphere of of all these. Gemini, at least two of us, aren't they? Uh, meant to be the twins. So uh, I can can do that. And one thing does lead to another, but it's all, all the more exciting when you give that out to someone else and then you see what they come back with. Well, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what, what you come back <laughs> with in that case. And keep, keep me posted about, uh, about, about your upcoming projects. Is there anything that you'd like to mention here now? Well, no, I've just done, uh, yeah, we're, we've got a couple of things. Oh, if you'd like to, if someone wants to have a look at bonobo.tv, mm -hmm. um, then they'll see some of the collaborations that Darren and I have done together using pictures and stuff. Um, my own site, which is artistjefffrancis.com, that has a huge amount of stuff on it. Um, but what I was going to say, yes, I haven't been painting much for the last 18 months but I've done over 200 sets of lyrics um so it I uh, yeah I do um tend once I get going to to fire and fire and fire you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh you know in between are the the moments of contemplation when things feel a bit dark as well mm -hmm. well there's so much here to talk about and we could go on for a long time but I've I've really enjoyed I really enjoyed this chat and um, meeting you getting getting That's... to know you uh for you know this half hour yeah. and and I hope oh, I hope there will be I hope there will be another opportunity so thank you so much thank you so much Jeff. yeah I'd, I'd love to see you Hi everyone, thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more of the same, then feel free to hit subscribe on our channel or for more similar coverage, visit our website at www.thecuspmagazine.com. Thanks, and I'll see you another time.